Hello, and welcome to Fairview Baptist Church. I'm Pastor John Boyacek. I'm so glad you could join us in worship today. I trust that you will be blessed. Well, good morning and happy new year. It is a happy new year, isn't it? It's funny how a couple of months ago we were planning for this day and, and uh, we're thinking two services, we'll get back at it and uh, people want to come out and then Omicron hits and uh, here we are. But I'm thankful you're here this morning, I really am. And um, I think I'm, my prayer is that we get through this very quickly and get back to even a whole new normal, a better normal, and uh, in the next couple of weeks. But I'm glad you're here this morning, and I'm glad you can join us online too. You know, one of the most famous, brilliant people in history was Albert Einstein. We use his name in synonymous with someone who is smart. Sometimes we use it as someone to make fun of. Oh, you're an Einstein in that, aren't you? But anyways, but, but many times it's to say, hey, you're a smart person. And he was a smart part, person. But not all aspects of his life was he really smart. A, a collection of his letters were auctioned off in 1996. And, and it, it contains a list of marital expectations for his wife, Malivia Marek. And he got uh, married to her in 1914. And, and some of the lists, on the, some of the things that he listed on this expectations that he had for his, his new bride were, was this. Daily laundry kept in good order. Three meals regularly in my room. In my room. A disc maintained neatly for my use only. And he demanded that she quit taking, or, uh, and, and the demand that she quit talking or leave the room if I request it. The marriage, unfortunately, ended in divorce. Einstein, even though he was considered brilliant, could not hold a, a relationship together. Seems like he was so focused uh, on, on more scientific and, and practical things than wanting to have a, a loving, healthy marriage. One writer says this about this situation. It says, compared with Einstein's requirements, modern marital expectations have surely evolved for the better. Or have they? A recent insightful study theorizes that as many people abandon ch attending church, they start expecting romantic relationships to satisfy a host of needs that formerly were satisfied through worshiping God. If you think clean laundry and regular meals require effort, Try meeting the demands of our relationship worship today by providing transcendence, unconditional love, wholeness, meaning, worth, and communion with your marital partner. Now, I don't really want to talk about marriages today. Instead, I do want to talk about relationships and relationships with others and some of our expectations, and specifically our relationship with God, our relationship with God. The challenge that Einstein had with his marriage was that he had lots of head knowledge and it could write down a lot of good theories on paper. But with all his knowledge and his brilliance, he could not put some things into practice. We start at 2022. Out with the old, in with the new. <laughs> Let's put 21 behind us, right? There were some good things about 2021 as I look back on it, but there were some difficult things about 2021. We need some new things this year. Um, the problem at times I found last year, I, I found I was sometimes in my own head. And what I mean by that is I found myself just set, settling into patterns of comfort and listening to myself at times. You couldn't go very far. Um, the, the routine that I had with me and my family within our house, within our proximity, it, it was easy to be lazy. It was easy to coast. 
You listen to the news, you, you stay in your bubble, you don't venture too far, you play it safe, and you, you really had no choice but to do that. If I didn't like someone or something, I would just turn off the computer or turn off the television and they would go away. Uh, staying in my regular pattern and being very comfortable was pretty easy. Things like hospitality or in-person meetings or, or, uh, or for some people even basic hygiene wasn't considered for days because we were all isolated. I heard that a lot of new shirts were, were sold this past year, but not a whole lot of pants because everybody was just waist up on, 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 in meetings. Um, our interaction with people became more of a minimum. And often our phone conversations were about how were we feeling that day and what's new going on. Not a whole lot. I'm stuck in my house. What were the COVID numbers and other alarming things around the world? Not much not new. At times, not a ton of growth. Often comfort, familiar surroundings. <laughs> At times, just boring. And I would say, over this past year, at times our relationships became a bit stale. You're locked in the same place. You can't go too far. You can't really do too many adventures because you can't go too far. At times you want distance with the people you live with, but they're in the other room on the other computer doing their schoolwork or, or, or doing uh, their other job or something like that. And, and it's hard to get away from them at times. Or even going to restaurants together. It's not something that happened that often. Even meeting new people has been tough this past year. And with our relationships, the dynamic had changed. And, and at this past year, I would say it, it really hasn't been that easy, especially with some of the closer people. And I would venture to say that many here and their relationship with the Lord may not have been the most stellar this past year. Sure, you've had those quiet times and a lot of downtime. But how has your relationship with the Lord been this past year. This morning, I want us to look at a few passages about our relationship with God. And as we approach this new year, make it your ambition to come closer, to draw closer to Him in 2022. As God has revealed Himself in Scripture, and I, I just want to take a, a, little, a little survey of, of Scripture, just looking at the way God wants a relationship with us. And as God has revealed himself in Scripture, in the Word, we see some dynamic uh, aspects to him. In Genesis chapter 1 and 2, and we, we see Adam and Eve, God walking with them in the garden. They, they had this great, unhindered, phenomenal relationship. But because of Adam and Eve's rebellion, because of Adam and Eve's sin, that intimate relationship was severed. And as Genesis continues on, humans have a difficulty carrying on that relationship with God. Rebellion happened. Time and time again, rebellion happened. And, and, and humans got so evil, and, and they hated God so much that God had to wipe out humanity, except for Noah and his family. And Noah and his family, they had struggles too with their relationship with God. And then we have Abraham coming on the scene in Genesis chapter 12 and, and, and further in chapter 15. And God calls him. And God makes a covenant with him. This holy, righteous God making a covenant with lowly Abraham. Why did God call Abraham? Because of his grace. That's it. He says, Abraham, I've got a plan for you. I've got a plan for you and your future generations. And his relationship with God at times was quite messy. And at times it, it involved animals and animal sacrifices. And the story goes on and we have Moses. And we're met with Moses in Exodus chapter 3 verses 13 through uh, 16. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn there. Let's, let's look at a couple of these passages. Exodus chapter 3 verses 13 through 16. Moses <coughs> uh, was... In, in Pharaoh's household, uh, ended up murdering somebody, had to flee. And God calls Moses out in the desert as he's tending the sheep. And in chapter 3, verse 13, it says this. Moses says to God, 
suppose I, I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? And the reason why they would ask him that name is because the, the Egyptian gods had so many different gods with different names. And then, then what shall I say to them, Moses said. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. I am who I am. Another name, Yahweh. This God who is above every other God, this God who's supremely above everybody, yet he wants to have a relationship with his people. He cares. This great, righteous, holy God wants a relationship with his people. And as Moses led the great nation of, Egypt, uh, of, of Israel out of Egypt, uh, he gives them the law. And, and their first response to the law is an act of rebellion. Uh, and, the, and God gives them the law. The first Ten Commandments had to do with the character of God. And in, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, the first ten, uh, of the Ten Commandments says, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Hey, don't make a god. You shall not make for yourself an image formed of anything in heaven or above or in the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. And time and time again, God told them this. And, and the Israelites made idols to worship. They made their bull to worship. And they said, no, we need something that we can see. We need something that we can look at like we had in Egypt. And they ended up copying the other nations as they settled into Israel, adopting their local gods to worship. They struggled with the fact that God was the God of the universe and they wanted someone they could handle, someone they could see, someone they could make up. And, and the prophets, time and time and dead, kept calling the people back to him, God. Come back to this great God Almighty, this powerful being who has shown us the way to live. But so many of them struggled following after him. They wanted a God who they could handle. And over in Isaiah chapter 40, I encourage you to turn there. Isaiah chapter 40, uh, verse 18. A great passage that Isaiah reminds them of who God is. Isaiah 40, verse 18. It says this, With whom then will you compare God? To what image will you liken him? As for an idol, a metal worker casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and fashions silver chains for it, a person too poor to present such an offering selects wood that will not rot, and they look for a skilled worker to set up an idol that will not topple. Are you going to make a God like that? Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told from you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. And its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner are they did take root on the ground than he blows them and they wither and the whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One. Lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created these? He who brings out the starry hosts one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. God. We're, we're given a picture of, of this great, mighty God who is above everything, even above the universe. Yet he wants a relationship with his people. He's so great. He's so awesome. He is so mighty. So, so big. He's, he's so difficult to even comprehend. 
And I, I think of what Isaiah 40 verse 28 says. It says, do you not know, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God. The creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. And his understanding no one can fathom. He, 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 you just can't understand God. He has more energy than anybody does. He has more strength than anybody does. He is so much greater and bigger and stronger than anything you could dream or imagine. You know, I marvel these days at technology and the things that the, the new companies are coming out with in terms of technology. In fact, I can't even wrap my head around some of the new things that, that are coming out that are so complex and, and computerized and, and so powerful. These, these technological items, it, it's amazing. But when I think about it, God sees those complex computers, those intricate wiring and, and these, these high, high um, computer chip, high, high powerful computer chips, he, he sees them as child's play. God's ways are so much more complex. We're still trying to figure out the things that he created. <laughs> like the brain. Do, do scientists really understand the brain? They hardly understand the brain. The eye and, and, and the makeup of the eye and even aspects of the eye or, or aspects of, of the cell, the, the little tiny cells, they, they still haven't figured that one out. And then studying the great grand universe, it, it's so mind-boggling for them to, to wrap their heads around. And it just shows us that God, the creator of everything, he is so much greater than us. And yet he wants a relationship with us. And then we come to the New Testament. And we, we have God doing something almost preposterous. Taking on flesh. Being born in this humble manner. Uh, and, and living like the average person. And then Jesus, God in the flesh, says words like this. He says, hey, come to me. All you are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And take my yoke upon you and learn from me, and I am a gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. God's saying, hey, just come to me. Come to me. I, I want a relationship with you. Just come to me and, and, and take on my yoke, okay? T take on what I want you to take on here. The world gives you a much heavier yoke, and, and you can never live up to that worldly yoke, but take on my yoke, because my yoke is easy. My burden's light. I got some good things for you. That's the type of relationship he calls us into, and he wants us to come. In John 6.35, Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never grow hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. He's talking about sustenance. He's talking about water and bread, sustenance for life, the basic things for life. Jesus, we can find that in Jesus. We can find that in God. He gives us everything we need. We come to him if we're weary, if we're burdened, and he comes and he gives us sustenance. Do you turn to him in those times? He gives us eternal life. And then Jesus tells us these insights about God. It says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now, now remain in my love. He has this great love, this love that's unconditional, this, this love is, that's everlasting, this, this love that's really beyond any type of love that you and I could ever experience in any type of relationship. He has that with the Heavenly Father, but he also wants to give it to us. And, and John, if you, if you, if you do a, a study on love, look at John. The book of John and John and 1 John, he it talks about love so many times. It says, Jesus replied, anyone who loves me uh, uh, will obey my teaching. My Father will love them and, and they will come at, uh, and we will come and, and make our home with them. He wants to make his home with us. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. And these words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. These words of love, these words of coming, these words of, of establishing this relationship. Or John, 1 John 3, verse 1, it says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that's what we are. Again, we're His children. We, this Father, this Son, this Father-Daughter relationship. 
We're his children. Ah, this, this relationship. And then John 14, verse 21 it says, whoever has uh, my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I too will love them and show myself to him. He calls us into this relationship. But he also says, hey, no, we also keep, you also keep my commands. How well do we know his commands? His commands are not necessarily rules and if we break one of those rules, we get punished for it, breaking them. No, his, his commands are more about building a, a relationship with him, becoming more intimate with him and, and, and with the things of God. He wants us to have a growing, dynamic, deeper relationship with him and, and for us to get to know him more and more and, and for, you, for us to say, well, I already know all about him. No, you don't. We, we never will. For all eternity, we, we will never understand him completely. He gives us commands because he wants to give us life and give us life to the full. That's, that's what he's all about. And so I guess the question I have for you is, how's it going? How's it going with your relationship with God? I, I find that there are people who have a relationship with God in the same way I have a relationship with Elon Musk. Now, let me tell you about my friend Elon He's close to my age. He was born on June the 28th, 1971, exactly one year, one month, and two days after my birth. Uh, he's the oldest child with his brother Kimball and his younger sister Tosca. He was born in Petrolia, uh, South Africa, and at the age of 17, he moved to Canada. He attended Queen's University, and not many of us knew him when he was here in Canada, but in the end, he ended up transferring to Pennsylvania and graduated with a degree from the university down there in um, engineering, uh, in economics and physics. And after graduating, he ended up find, founding a, a few companies, and, and one of his more famous company was PayPal. And PayPal was bought out by eBay in 2002 for $1.5 billion. And then he decided to go into the rocket industry, and he started up SpaceX in, in 2004, and uh, then he joined Tesla Mortar uh, uh, Company and became the CEO of that company in 2008. He also created another company called Solar City, and uh, in 2016, he also created the Boring Company, uh, a tunnel construction company. He's done a lot of things, a very, very entrepreneurial guy. And I can go on and on with other businesses that Elon has, has done. In 2000, he married his, his wife, uh, Justine Wilson, while attending Queen's University. Uh, I, I missed the wedding. I, I wasn't able to go to that wedding. Um, their first child uh, sadly died 10 months when, uh, in 10 weeks because of uh, Southern uh, Infant Syndrome. And um, they also had five other children, Xavier and Griffin and, and then triplets, Kai, Saxon and Damon. And and, and the, the twins and the triplets, they're similar age to my kids, Josh and Alina. And so we have some other things in common, as you can see. Unfortunately, that relationship to his first wife fell apart. And then he had another one with Tilala Riley. And that ended in 2016. And right now, he's not in a marriage. But, but I can go on and on with all my things I know about my friend Elon. Uh, back in November, he was worth $300 billion. And although he would call himself asset rich and cash poor. It's amazing how people hang on every word of a tweet that he might share because what he shares at times really affects the stock market. He is that powerful of a person. And that is my friend Elon. Now, most of you are smart people out there and you know that I'm not friends with Elon Musk and I only know some facts about Elon. He doesn't know me. I've never met him. The wealthiest man in the world and one of the most tech-savvy men in the world probably doesn't want to have much to do with someone like me. But I use this illustration to show you how some people treat their relationship with God. In fact, how some people view God. They view God as someone they know a lot of facts about. I know these things about God. I know the teachings about God. I know some of the great things that God has done. 
But have you entered a relationship with him? Have you entered a relationship with him? He sent his son Jesus Christ to have a relationship with us. His son Jesus Christ came to this earth to die on the cross for our sins. He he came and, 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 and took the penalty of the death that I deserved, that you deserved. And he went to the cross for that to give us a relationship with God because we have this problem called sin and it separates our relationship with a truly holy, awesome God. And Jesus came to pay the price for all our sins because we couldn't pay it for ourselves. He loved us so much to do that. And he offers the free gift of salvation to those who only receive it, to those who believe it, to those who take it upon themselves. Have you done that? Have you entered that relationship with him? And maybe you have entered that relationship. But still, that relationship tends to be more about facts and knowledge and understanding. Not necessarily a strong relationship. Yeah, you know your Bible. You know the things about God. You know your theology. But what about your relationship? Is it growing? Is it growing? Like any relationship, there are ebbs and flows. And how is it? these days. I believe all relationships can be approved on, improved upon. And as we move into 2022, I believe Christ wants to go deeper with you. He wants to go deeper with you. But are you willing to go deeper with him? There are some things that you and I can do to deepen our relationship with him, to make it richer and, and stronger. He, he, he's out there. He's saying, come, come to me. But so often we don't want to do any type of discipline to enter more into a deeper relationship. We're told that there are different disciplines of the faith. Things that we need to do to to really deepen at times our relationship with God. To deepen that relationship. And I'm just giving you a little list of some things that can help with you to deepen your relationship with God. Uh, One thing is regular time in the Word. Uh, some people say, I've got to read my whole Bible. Well, you, you could read the whole Bible here. That there, there are reading plans out there, and I encourage you to do one of those. But many times I'd say, just read until you're blessed. Read maybe a couple verses, maybe read one verse, maybe even read one sentence a day from Scripture so that you understand God, some things to dwell upon. Um, it's not so much the, the, the amount that you take in, it's more about the content that you take into your heart. What's your daily time in the Word? We, we have things called our daily bread out there, and they, just a couple of verses to read each day and a little devotional with it. You could start with that if you haven't started with that. But there are other ways to even go deeper in the Word. Do you take regular time with the Word? Maybe a prayer life. Do you have a prayer journal? Writing things that you're praying for. How's your conversation with God these days? How's your prayer life with God? What are you talking to God about these days? What are you wrestling with God with? What are the prayers in, the, in, in Scripture, that, that, in, in those prayers, and how are you modeling your prayers after those prayers within Scripture? How's your prayer life? What about praying with others? Praying with your family, praying with your, yeah, in, in prayer meetings. We have prayer meetings that meet here throughout the week. We, we also have small groups that meet. And Now, this past year, it's been difficult to get small groups together, but we hope to have some new ones just praying together with others. I find it sometimes just really rewarding and enriching, just taking time to pray with one another, and we spur one another on to more praying. Are you doing that? Maybe some of you need to start that this year. We're doing a week of prayer and fasting a week from now, and I encourage you to be part of that, to take time to fast. Fast from food, if you're able to do that. Fast from something that takes up a lot of time in your life and saying, God, I love you more than these typical things that are in my life. And I'm going to focus on you more during these times. I'm going to seek you more than these things. Maybe you haven't never done a week of prayer and fasting. Maybe, I, maybe it's time to do that this year. Uh, regular attendance at church. It's been tough to regularly attend. And some people have really gotten to know that habit this past year. And some people are frightened to come into groups of people. I, I, I believe COVID is going to be over soon. And it's time to come back out. It's time to come back out. And maybe to deepen that relationship with God, you need more fellowship with one another and some type of regular attendance. Um, fill your mind 
with God's Word through teaching and, or podcasts or, or music or videos. And instead of listening to secular music, listening to secular videos, uh, uh, listening to podcasts of true crime all the time or something like that, what, what about some other good teachers that are out there and filling your minds with those things so that it just deepens your relationship with the things of God? Family devotions. Are you doing devotions with your family? Um, uh, praying with your spouse, do you do that regularly? Uh, sharing your faith. Uh, w- one way to, to get closer to God is saying, God, help me share my faith with this co-worker. Help, help me share my faith with my neighbor. Help me share my faith. I'm praying for this person. I'm praying for this family member. At times that draws you closer to God. Um, uh, serving, using your gifts. Uh, st- taking a step out of your comfort zone, using your gifts and your abilities to serve God in certain areas and depending on Him more and more. Uh, short-term mission trip. <laughs> Going into a short-term ministry, mission trip usually it requires a lot of preparation spiritually to do that, and depending on God. It, it's, it's, it's a practical way of maybe deepening your relationship with God. A Bible study group, or uh, discipling others, saying, hey, Lord, is there somebody I should do a one-on-one Bible study with this year? I've never done that before. And disciple somebody. And, and help them to grow, because as you're trying to teach them, you have to depend on God even more, too. And the list can go on and on and on about different ways that you and I can deepen our relationship with God through dis- discipline, through, through, yeah, at times some hard work. And I handed these things out before the service. I hope you received that. It's called Spiritual Disciplines 2022. And you should have two of them, um, but I'm not making you do this, but you can write this down. This year, by God's grace, I plan on, what, what do you plan on maybe changing this year, implementing this year, doing something different this year to help me draw closer to God? Please hold me accountable to this. And you can put your name on there and you can put your phone number on there. And there's a box at the Welcome Center and it's written on the box, Spiritual Disciplines. And you can just t- take the lid off and put that in there. And somebody later this month will give you a call and just say, hey, how's it going? I find that times when I exercise, I need some people to hold me accountable. But sometimes with our spiritual exercises, we need people to hold us accountable too. And this isn't about pride. This is about saying, hey, no, I, I need a little bit more discipline in my life to go deeper with God this year. And, and what is it that you're going to do? I want to encourage you to do something. So take that time, fill that out. And uh, Charlotte Morley's coming up here. And she's going to sing a song just to prepare our hearts for communion. But preparing our hearts for a deeper walk with our Heavenly Father too. And um, listen to the words of these songs. Fill out this form and, and place it in the box after, uh, out of church. And, and keep the other one tucked in your Bible or something like that so that you hold yourself accountable and make some changes for God's glory this year. I am so glad you're able to join us today in worship. If you have a need, a prayer request, feel free to reach out to us at the church here. You can give us a call or you can also email us. God bless you.